to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at 1-855. 458-3905. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. In Acts chapter 19 verse 1, the Apostle Paul found certain disciples and he asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And in response to that question, in Acts 19 verse 2, they said, We have not even heard so much as whether there is a Holy Spirit. There was a lot of confusion in the first century among some disciples about the Holy Spirit just as there is today. We welcome you to our study of the fundamentals of the faith. And today we address the subject, fundamental subject of the Holy Spirit, His work, His function, and what about His work today among Christians. You know, when we think about the Holy Spirit, there is a lot of mass confusion. There is ignorance. There is a lot of areas where emotionalism and sometimes where feelings take over as it relates to the Holy Spirit. And so today we simply want to examine from the Scripture some basic facts uh, about the Holy Spirit that will equip us to better know about that person of the Godhead and to help us in defending and standing up for the truth. What do we know about the Holy Spirit's nature? Like the Father and like the Son, the Holy Spirit is identified as a person of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit has certain qualities that are unique to His function. For example, the Holy Spirit speaks. First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, The Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith. And so we know as relating to the nature of the Holy Spirit, He speaks. That is, He had the ability to give His revelation to men and women in the first century. The Holy Spirit has the ability to feel in some ways. Ephesians 4 verse 30 and James chapter 4 verse 5, Christians are taught not to grieve or vex the Holy Spirit has some way of grieving, some way of being vexed, some way of being brought to a righteous jealousy over God's people concerning His love for them. The Holy Spirit in the New Testament is not identified as some inanimate it. Rather, in Scripture, He is identified as masculine in person. Listen to the language here. John 16, 13, Jesus said, When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He 
will guide you into all truth. Hebrews 10 verse 15, the Holy Spirit is again identified as He. And so masculine in person is the way the Scripture identifies the Holy Spirit. And we know as well, the Holy Spirit is a part of the Godhead. Let me illustrate this to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And here's a passage where we have all three persons of the Godhead identified. Listen to the words of 2 Corinthians 13 verse number 14. Paul says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Grace of Christ, love of God, communion of the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all mentioned as part of the Godhead. Genesis chapter 1, we see much of the same. The Spirit of God hovered upon the face of the deep. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. And so even at the beginning, the Holy Spirit Himself was there. But one of the most pressing questions as it relates to the, the Holy Spirit is, how does the Holy Spirit communicate with people. How did He do it in the Bible? And is He still doing that today? Many people believe the Holy Spirit communicates through uh, hunches or intuitions or some inner leading. This is such a, a highly subjective and feeling-based idea and it's not just biblical. It's just not biblical. In the New Testament it wasn't a nudge or a hunch or, or some feeling-based intuition. The Holy Spirit communicates in the medium of communication that people use today. Language, voices, the voice that spoke. God's means of communication in the Bible is through words and language. Now, let me give you a couple of passages that teach this in Scripture. 2 Samuel 23 and verse 2. The Spirit spoke by me, David said. Now watch this. How did he do that? His word was on my tongue. How did the Spirit communicate to David? He spoke by David. How did he do that? His word was on David's tongue. The Spirit has always communicated in the medium of words, through language. Uh, 1 Timothy 4 verse 1. Again, the Scripture clearly says, The Spirit expressly says... He uses language to do that. Revelation 2 verse 11, the Spirit speaks or says again is the idea. And so when we think about how does the Holy Spirit communicate, is, am I receiving some kind of nudge? or How did He do that in the Bible? He used the medium of language and words to do that in Scripture, and that has always been the method that He chose. But friend, as we think about the Holy Spirit, Let's also realize the Spirit had a function in man's salvation. I understand God's part. He put the plan into action. I understand Christ's part. He came to this earth and sacrificed Himself for the salvation of mankind. But what's the function of the Holy Spirit in man's salvation? Friend, the function of the Holy Spirit in, man, in man's salvation is to get the message about the Father and about the Son into the hands and hearts and lives of men and women today through God's Word. Uh, think about these words. I want you to think about the words of Revelation chapter 1. I think they so beautifully describe the work of the Spirit in getting God's message of salvation to us. Listen to these passages in Revelation. Revelation chapter 1 verse 11, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last. Now watch this. Here's what the Spirit said to John. What you see, write in a book and send to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. The Spirit had a function here in getting His message out. And He used John as a tool. And here's what He said to John. What you see, draw a picture of. No, I didn't want He said. Make a movie about. Do a play on. No. Write in a book. God's message of salvation has been written in a book. That book is the Bible. Listen again to Revelation chapter 2 and notice what Christ says to the church. Revelation 2 verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. And so we use our ears to hear the message of God, and that's how God spoke.
to his churches in the first century. And so here's the process God used. The Lord dictated to John. Holy Spirit dictated to John. John wrote down what was dictated. The Lord said that was what the Holy Spirit says, and thus the Holy Spirit's work was putting the message in a form, a book form that men and women could have throughout the centuries. That's always been the plan of God. I'll give you another passage to think about. John 16, verse 13. Jesus said this of the Spirit. When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He'll guide you into all truth. You'll not have to speak on your own authority. Whatever He says and what He hears from the Father, that'll be what you speak in essence. When the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus said, He's going to guide you. Who? The immediate apostles right there. He's going to guide you into all truth. Friend, did that day come? You bet it did. Acts chapter 2. They're, they're assembled together there. The Holy Spirit comes upon them. They begin to speak in unknown languages. Peter stands up with the eleven and they begin to preach the message of Jesus Christ. Men and women heard that message. The message spoken in words. And we have that message revealed to us in the pages of the Bible. And so, does the Spirit have a function in salvation? Sure He does. He got the message revealed, written, in, in form that could be written down, revealed to men and women, and that message has been written down for all centuries. And the Bible is the product of God through the Holy Spirit giving us the message of salvation. Now, friend, we want to address this also. Does the Spirit play a part in the revelation of the message? There's no doubt we've already seen He does, but exactly what part did He play? And this is so important because you know, I hear a lot of people today say, well, the Spirit is speaking. The Holy Spirit told me to do this. Wait a minute now. Is that the way God's working? And is that the way God worked in the first century? I want to direct your attention to a passage in the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, about verses 9 following, Paul indicates how the Spirit got God's revelation to people then and how the Spirit worked in the first century. Listen to 1 Corinthians 2, beginning in verse number 9. The Bible says, As it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who loved Him. But now watch this. What about those things God wants us to know? But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. For now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of Him who is from God, that we might know the things which have been freely given to us by God. Now watch this. These things we also speak. Not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Watch these things that are identified. The Scripture teaches us from this passage, it takes a revelation to know God. How can I know the things about God and the things He's prepared for His creation? I can know it because God has revealed them to us. It takes a revelation to know God. That revelation must be made in words. Not in words which human wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. And that revelation was spoken through the mouths of the men directed by the Holy Spirit. And so to know God, I've got to have a revelation. That revelation has been written in words. Those words came through the men in the first century. And my friends, we have that revelation right here in our hands today in the form of the Bible. What about the Spirit in Revelation? God used the Spirit in the first century to reveal His message and His plan of salvation, and we have that preserved in the form of the Word of God today. Do I Listen carefully. Do I need more than what was revealed in the first century? I want you to listen again to John 16, 13. Jesus said, when He... The Spirit of truth has come. He will guide you into all truth. Now consider, he's writing to that, talking to that immediate group of people who would become the apostles. Consider that that happened in the first century to those men and as promised, when he came, and he did come, 
He would guide them into all truth. Can you have more than all truth? If the Holy Spirit came and He did, and if He revealed His message to the apostles and He did, do we have all truth today? Listen to 2 Peter 1 verse 3. The Bible says, according to His divine knowledge, God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through Him who called us. Am I looking for another revelation today? No. Nope. Is the Book of Mormon another revelation of Jesus Christ? No. Why not? Because in the first century, God revealed all truth. Jude verse 3, It was once for all delivered to the saints. If God once for all delivered the message that we must contend earnestly for, we're not looking for something new, something different. We've got everything we need to know God, know about His plan, and go to heaven in the pages of the Bible. Now, we've mentioned it, and we know that it's directly related to these ideas, but it's worth bearing out again. We ask the question, where exactly does the Scripture say the Holy Spirit's words are located at? Inspired men of God, to whom this promise, He would guide them into all truth, they're not with us today. This is a simple fact that any person can notice. God promised to the disciples, I'm going to guide you into all truth, but hey, those disciples have long perished. Where is that message and that revelation? Friend, we know well, their words, which are inspired by God, are still alive today. The Word of God is living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. How's that Word alive? Friend, we find the revelation of the Holy Spirit deposited in the pages of the New Testament. Listen to Hebrews 1 verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. John, what you see, write in a book. Revelation 1 verse 7. If any man thinks himself to be a, a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge, Paul said, the things which we've commanded you, things we've written to you, these are the commandments of God. Where are the commandments of God? The things Paul wrote, the things John wrote, the things the apostles wrote down. And so the Holy Spirit's Word, my friend, it's recorded in the pages of the Bible. It's living and powerful. It is God's power unto salvation. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Now, sometimes I will hear people say, as it relates to the Holy Spirit, and as it relates to the Bible, well, we need something more. We need something fresher. We need something newer. We may need more than what's in the Bible. We need another revelation. Let's ask this question. Do these words, which we've identified as the words of the Holy Spirit, do they meet our needs today? Friend, the Bible clearly teaches it alone makes us complete before God. Do you remember 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17? The Scripture says, the Holy Spirit's Word says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Profitable for what? Doctrine, correction, correction or proof, instruction and in righteousness. Listen now, don't miss this. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Does the Bible, does the Holy Spirit's Word claim it makes us complete for every good work. You bet it does. If this book makes me complete, it meets our needs. John 16, 13. When the Spirit comes, He will guide you into all truth. You can't have more than all. If the Spirit came, this book meets our needs. Again, 2 Peter 1, 3. We've got everything we need for two items, life and godliness. I've got everything I need in the Bible according to the divine knowledge of God to know how to live the best life, John 10, verse 10, and to be a godly person. Now, friend, I want you to listen real carefully. And we say these things in love and in kindness and, and because we love God and His Word. If the Bible makes us complete before God and if it gives us everything we need to live the best life and to be a godly person, why then do we need God's Spirit to do more than that today? Do we need more than everything, and can you have more than being complete? Of course not. God, in His work and purpose in the Holy Spirit, in its function, 
perfectly did his job, revealed the will of God to us, got that message of salvation. And today I have everything I need to get to heaven and to be a godly person. Which leads us directly to another question that is so prevalent and popular today. Is the Holy Spirit nudging me? Is He giving me some kind of intuition? Am I, am I being, you know, I hear people say, well, the Holy Spirit's leading me to do this. Really? How do you know the Holy Spirit's doing that? How do you know it's not some other type of feeling or emotion guiding you? This thinking, my friends, about the Holy Spirit nudging us or leading us to make some decision or do something, there's no doubt we can be led by the words of God in the Bible and let it guide and direct our lives, but is the Holy Spirit especially doing that for me or for you? Friend, this kind of thinking is contrary to Scriptures. I wouldn't want to hold a doctrine that's contrary to Scripture, and this kind of thinking causes a person to teach things that are just not found within the pages of the Bible. It leads to a further spiritual departure and it's not based on Scripture today. Where's the passage that teaches that the Holy Spirit is nudging or guiding or, or giving us some kind of intuition today? You read the pages of the Bible and I don't find that the Holy Spirit is nudging me. Is God guiding me? Is the Spirit of God Working in Christians today? Absolutely. How? In the pages of the Word of God. Through the truth that God has revealed. But to say, you know, the Spirit is leading me to make this decision. Let's, let's consider that line of thinking for a moment. Someone says, okay, the Spirit is leading me to make this decision. That decision ends up being a decision that leads to sin, ungodliness, or immorality. I've heard it said. And you've heard people say that. And then you watch and that decision wasn't by the Holy Spirit, it's evident. Are we then going to turn around and say, well, maybe that wasn't by the Holy Spirit. Here's the real thing to consider. One person says, the Holy Spirit's nudging me. Another person says, the Holy Spirit's nudging me. And a whole bunch of other people are saying, the Holy Spirit is leading me to do this. And then we, how do we know? Some turned out not to be. Evidently they weren't. Some, you know, how do we know either way? Can you be sure? in those scenarios. I can be sure I'm being led by God's Spirit as I let the Bible guide and lead me. This is how God guides and leads us today through His Spirit. There's no doubt the Bible says the Father dwells in me. 1 John 4 verse 15. The Bible says that Christ is in us. Colossians 1 verse 27. And, and the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit, Christians do have the Holy Spirit, but how do they have the Holy Spirit? As the words of God in the Bible live in our lives, that's how the Holy Spirit leads Christians today. Now, friend, we don't want to say, and we don't want to leave the impression that the Holy Spirit is dead and that He is not at work today. But we do want to note the way in which He is alive and working. And so we ask the question, is the Holy Spirit still at work today? Is He still doing things today? Yes, but only through the message He revealed and only in the medium in which He chose to do that. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37, does the, does the Spirit's message, the message revealed by the Holy Spirit, still work on men and women's hearts today? You bet it does. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 130 that the, the God's Word it had entrance into their heart. Did the Word of God given by the Holy Spirit work on the heart of men and women? It did in the first century. When Peter stood up and preached the Gospel, that which was directly given by the Holy Spirit, the Bible says in Acts 2 verse 37, they were cut to the heart. Did the Spirit's Word work on their heart? It absolutely did. Does that same Word work on people's heart today to change it? You bet it does. The Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There's no doubt this message is alive and that it's working and that the Holy Spirit is working through God's Word. But friend, I hope you'll listen real carefully. We're not living today in the day and age of the miraculous, in the sense that 
You're going to go out to the cemetery. You're not going to go out to the cemetery today. People are not going to go out to the cemetery today like they did in the first century, like Jesus did at the tomb of Lazarus. You're not going to go out and raise somebody who's in a cemetery. We're not going to see the type of miracles. We're not going to see anybody walking on water today like Jesus did. The miracles of the first century. A man's got a, a withered hand. You're not going to see somebody make that whole again. That's not happening. Those miracles, the Bible said, were going to end in the first century. Now, let me show you that from the Scriptures. Look in your Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I want you to see this for yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want you to look at what the Scripture says beginning in verse number 8. That beautiful passage about love teaches us that love is supreme, even supreme, over the miraculous. 1 Corinthians 13 Beginning in verse number 8, the Scripture records, Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there is our tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away with. The partial is the miraculous. Tongue speaking, miraculous knowledge, uh, all those things that are mentioned there, prophesying, all that's going to be done away with when that which is perfect has come. Now, Jesus has already come and He's already gone back by the time of the writing of this book. What's He talking about here? There's only one other thing identified in Scripture as complete or perfect. And that is the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16, it makes us complete. James 1 verse 25, it is the perfect law of liberty. And so miracles were partial. They were in part until that perfect came, which is the full will of God. In fact, did you know miracles were given in the first century to confirm this Word? Mark 16.20, Hebrews 2 verses 3 and 4, they were given to confirm the Word of God. You've got two people. Both says, I've got a message from God. One man speaks and it's different. Another man speaks and it's different. How do I know who's telling the truth? This man just did a miracle. God's sign of approval is on him. This man we don't know about. I've been confirmed. His message has been confirmed by God. Today we have the full revealed will of God. And friend, our hope and our encouragement is that we'll let God's message and God's power through the Holy Spirit work in men and women's lives today as they read and study the Bible, obey its message, and put it to use in their lives and live for Christ each and every day. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.